Hey everyone, Phil Ebener here with Brian Birmingham, the lead instructor for the Screenwriting Masterclass. We are super excited to come together today to have a little chat conversation. We're gonna dive a little bit deeper into some of the topics that he covered in the class. You're going to get to know Brian a little bit better. I have some questions, just a quick Q&A to kind of help you get to know Brian a little bit better. I think these kind of sessions are fun for students, for potential students. So if you are in this class, we hope you've really enjoyed the class. And in this video, we're just gonna kind of recap some of the things we've covered. I'm gonna ask a couple questions just to go a little bit deeper. And if you haven't enrolled in the class, well, hopefully this gives you a sense of what this screenwriting master class is all about. Um, but Brian, how, how are you feeling right now? Feeling good. <laughs> yeah. Feeling really good about the way it turned out, I think. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't watched any of it yet. So. <laughs> yeah. I think it's going to be a, a great class. I mean, I am not a screenwriter and I'm kind of itching to write a screenplay right now. <laughs> well, I'm really happy to hear that. <laughs> I think I really wanted to try to cover just all of the major bases that I could for what the fundamental elements of a story are. And Obviously, with screenwriting, each lesson in the course could be its own class in itself. There's so much to unpack and so mm -hmm. much to know about writing. So it's hard to kind of make something comprehensive. But I feel like what we came away with is something that touches all the bases people need to know and, and gives you the right setup to dive into writing a screenplay and to be able to self-assess your own work and to kind of watch movies in a way that makes you see them differently and think about the way the stories are written and told and think about the way you think about your own ideas and um, everything along those lines. Yeah, so I've got a couple speed round questions for our students to get to know you a little bit oh, better. Boy. So no thinking, just first things that come to mind. Okay. Brian, and Brian, depending on when you watch this video, he's either gonna be my brother-in-law or right now he's my future brother-in-law. That's right. Which is pretty crazy. <laughs> so, and we also went to Loyola Marymount University together. So that's first how we met. Um, way back. And so, yeah, pretty cool <laughs> stuff. But anyways, Brian, I might know the answers to some of these, but uh, we'll see. What are your favorite activities outside of screenwriting? Oh, um, my biggest outlet outside of screenwriting is surfing. That's the one thing I like to do to escape, to get away from work, to get away from thinking and to just get out and, and do something that's not tied to my computer. Um, nice. Other than that, I love to draw and paint and play music. Just having other creative outlets, I think, is something that's always been important for me as far as focusing on one creative outlet, on focusing on something like writing. It's good to have other things you can do and feel like you can be terrible at something and it doesn't matter. With screenwriting, I think I put more pressure on myself. So mm -hmm. having these other things to do, like music or art, is just a nice thing to do for myself and not care if it doesn't come out well. <laughs> nice. And you mentioned surfing. Where did you grow up? I know the answer, but... <laughs> I grew up in Encinitas, which is a small little town just north of San Diego. I spent my whole life growing up there and moved to Los Angeles when I was 19. So I've been by the beach in Southern California for quite a long time now. Yeah, pretty cool. Okay, let's see. Favorite food? Oh, geez. Uh... That's, right right now, what's your favorite food? Uh, I think I'm just going to say Mexican food. I, <laughs> I, it's probably just because Doesn't I crave surprise it. me. It's, I love Mexican food. I love tacos, burritos, um, all of that stuff, which is probably <laughs> a result of the San Diego upbringing. Yeah. And it just sounds really good right now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Where is your favorite place that you've traveled? Oh, man. I think my favorite place that I've traveled was uh, Ireland. I just think that was a... Very cool country to see. Stayed in Dublin. It was a city unlike any other. And I would highly recommend visiting Ireland for anyone who has never been there before. It's a very cool, very interesting, unique city with a lot of history and a lot to, a lot of literary history too. If you like writing, uh, Dublin takes their Irish writers very seriously. <laughs> There's <laughs> mentions of James Joyce, Oscar Wilde, and Samuel Beckett everywhere you turn. So that's kind of fun for that's people. Cool. Like I've never been to Ireland. I've actually never been to like the UK or Ireland. I would love to go though, but uh, someday. It's easy because they speak English too. So yeah, yeah. I only know English, so that helps. All right. What do you have a favorite children's book? Hmm. Or one that as a kid you, you, <laughs> you 
it was one of your favorites? I think I really loved Where the Wild Things Are when I was a kid. I think it was just a very cool. It's very we just cool. read that book tonight to the boys. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. I'm sad I missed it. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good one. That's a great book. It's yeah. just a kind of dark and weird and imaginative. And yeah, I I would read. I haven't read it for a long time, but I need to dive back into that one. Well, as a parent now, like reading some of those old books, you you look you like see like how the writing is, and some of them are so simplistic. But like that book is so good. The, the writing, it's it's uh, a really good one. How they actually tell the story and bookend it. And as a kid, you don't. I don't know. I didn't like think. It, I don't even know if I really knew what the stories were as a kid. I just like saw the pictures and kind of knew the characters. But like, yeah. as an adult, you like start to see like, wow, some of these stories are pretty, pretty good actually. Yeah, it's the same with like a lot of Dr. Seuss ones. There's always mm-hmm. some kind of lesson in yeah. all of the weirdness. I think I liked all the characters in those books. Yeah, all the creatures and such. But moving on to now, last question, last speed round question is: What is? Uh, do you have a favorite like current TV series that you're into? Oh man, um, current. It's hard to say. I'm not very current on TV. I okay. feel like you the would past expect, like five years. Any... Past five years, I think Breaking Bad is the best show I've seen in a long time. And nice. That ended in 2013, so technically that was seven years. <laughs> yeah. But Man, that was a while ago. <laughs> it, time I flies. Know. It's crazy. But that one has stuck with me for a long time. So Yeah, I've got to rewatch that one. It's about time. Um, yeah. Highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. Just excellent storytelling from start to finish, from the first season to the sixth. Yeah. Um, I'm sure no one has recommended Breaking Bad to you before. So <laughs> yeah, really under the radar. Heard about it. You've got to check it out. <laughs> yeah. All right, so moving more to screenwriting, I wanted to ask you more about what your experience at Loyola Marymount in the film school was. Obviously, this class can't, it's like a completely different experience um, from a film school experience. Um, But I often like kind of talk in my classes more on video production about how like you can learn the skill. A lot of what I learned was outside the classroom actually and Mm -hmm. that's kind of what i've tried to pare down into like my online courses but i don't know how it was like in the screenwriting program and kind of like what was that experience like and i guess if someone's interested in like you know they're taking this class and they're like oh i wonder what actual film school would be like i don't know maybe you can share like kind of what a screenwriting program was like yeah absolutely i think it's really a lot more of what was just covered in this lesson. A lot of the fundamentals, it goes into more depth and obviously you touch on more um, advanced techniques in writing mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of it, it's like you said, a lot of the learning takes place outside of the classroom. Mm-hmm. With any creative pursuit, you have to know all the basics and have a mastery over it. But you also have to have that practical experience and you have to put yourself out there and make yourself learn how this works in the real world and how it works with the way you think and the way you are and and who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. So you can't necessarily tell someone how to write the perfect screenplay, but you can tell them what steps they need to take. And then they have to sort of connect the dots and and Mm -hmm. put themselves into it and follow those steps and then use their own originality and voice and things they've learned to make that as good as it can be. I think a big learning experience for me was interning at different production companies Mm -hmm. because you get a sense not only of the writing because you're constantly reading scripts that come in and doing coverage, which is essentially just writing a two-page summary of the script Mm -hmm. so the executives can know what's what without having to read 100 pages. Um, So reading those And is that what you're doing as an intern, like just reading scripts to kind of preview them? Walking some dogs and and filing and and (laughs) coffee and all the stuff that interns get to do. Yeah. But that's the most hands-on thing that was really cool. And you also just get a sense of what goes into the production. And Mm -hmm. it makes you think about the way you write when you see how that has to translate into a shoot Mm -hmm. and how that has to translate into production. Because you could write something insane on the page but then someone's gonna have to figure out okay how are we gonna get all of this together and Mm -hmm. make it work and so kind of having those different elements and and understanding what 
actors and directors have to make of a script mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. understanding the sort of cohesiveness of it all is really important. So I think learning screenwriting is great um, and, and film school does a good job too of teaching you what those other elements of making a film are mm -hmm. and what that means for each different person's role. And I think it's hard to be a great writer if you don't take the time to understand what your work means for the other people who ideally are going to be involved in getting it made. Mm, um, yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, as, as a film production major, yeah, that was kind of one of the best things is like going through all the different roles basically on a set. And I mean, I had to take a screenwriting class um, as a production major. Um, were most of your classes, I guess I'm trying to think like, you were in school for four years and learning like the format of a screenplay is pretty simple to cover in like one class, right? So were mo was most of your like screenwriting classes just like more about like, I don't know, was it like specific like character classes or story, like a lot about story or well, just I think, um, different types of film genres or what, what were like the actual classes like? It was like a lot of that and there's a lot of like cinema history so you could take a course mm -hmm. on one director or one mm -hmm. genre. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention that was really big about film school is the collaborative aspect. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a very extroverted person. When I work on my work, I like to just... Um, dive in and do it and and not be distracted but having professors who can read your work and give you the feedback that you're not going to get from mm. a friend or from you know your parents yeah is really crucial and then seeing where other um, students are as well I think is really important and seeing what other students are bringing to the table and, yeah. and doing in their writing and seeing the different ideas that are being generated by your peers I think is really valuable to get a better sense of where you stand and as far as your own voice and style and mm -hmm. um, what you bring to the table that's different and unique from all that. So I think if you're not going to film school, if you have friends who are writers or who want to be writers, absolutely uh, share your work with them and just find people who can give you that feedback, who you can collaborate with and share with, because it's going to help you out in the long run to get different perspectives on your stories. And I think too, the thing to remember is it's just like, at the end of the day, it's your script. If someone gives you a piece of advice that you don't like, you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. But it's still good to kind of just see what other people think about it. So Yeah. And I think like, well, you kind of touch on, but just like meeting people who might be like a producer or a director from film school, that was one of the best benefits for me. So that like post school, like all the, you kind of like form these groups and people like did their own productions together. And I think that's hard if you're taking an online class, screenwriting or whatever, but mm -hmm. that's probably like a good piece of advice is surround yourself with like non screenwriter friends too. like try to, you know, meet people who actually produce video. And, um, cause you mentioned in the course, like, you know, people have shot Hollywood movies on iPhones now and maybe more as an experiment but still like the ca quality of cameras like every i have this conversation with my friends all the time like we could just like make such a high quality film with like basic cameras now compared yeah. to like right when we were in film school it was kind of a transition to digital um cameras that or dslrs that had like the cinematic look to them but now like you can get those cameras for relatively cheap and uh, just self-produce and that it, that I mean that, yeah that just sounds fun <laughs> Completely, yeah and that's just an advantage you have as a writer now because I think even if you don't necessarily have a big interest in directing your stuff mm -hmm. you can record it with some friends who you you know lure over to and make them read your lines and see what <laughs> yeah. it looks like when yeah. it's read yeah but um, I think even just when I was growing up, and I'm not like that old. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I had like these, uh, I had this like, you know, the camera with the tapes and everything. And you had to yeah. like, you actually had tape. It was like a little cassette. <laughs> yeah. You had to put it into the, the camera. kids don't know this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, rewind and stuff. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I sound like an old person. Yeah. But anyway, I it's great to be able to just shoot a movie on your phone because, um, 
it's it's kind of just I think it gives you a different perspective on what it's like to see your words come to life because when you're just reading them on the page it's a lot different from when you hear them delivered and you might have written something that's a lot funnier than you thought it was or that's a lot clunkier than you thought it was or, or whatever it is it's it's good to kind of be able to hear it yeah all right, let's see. What's my next question? Uh, one question we got from a follower on Instagram was, um, how do you like get inspired? And I think probably what they're asking is like, how do you get inspired to like get up in the morning and start writing? Or and or how do you f- how have you found like story ideas? I think. Um... As far as being inspired to get up in the morning, I think if you want to be a writer, it takes a certain sense of discipline. Mm -hmm. And I think all of us, um, not just as writers, but as people can struggle with that. And it's just so easy to procrastinate and to Mm -hmm. sit down to write and then find something else to do for a while and then realize an hour has passed and you've written like one word. (laughs) So I think just discipline is more important as far as finding the inspiration to, to sit down and work and just kind of setting that mindset of like, okay, this is what I'm going to do when I'm going to do it. And, um, I'm just going to stick to it. It's like, once you have a plan, if you don't stick to it, you feel like you've let yourself down and it it makes it easier to be productive. Mm -hmm. I think as far as inspiration for ideas go, um, it's, it's just so, uh, it's not a very tangible thing. I think it's hard to, you can't say like, these are the steps to getting inspired. I think obviously looking to other forms of art, um, paintings, uh, music, movies that are coming out, books, um, Mm -hmm. conversation, just um, these are the kind of things that can spark ideas. And when you're, you have that sort of awareness that you're looking for something you want to write about, ideas tend to come to you a little more naturally because you kind of have that, um, that radar going in the Mm -hmm. back of your mind. So I have literally had ideas for stories, um, just driving in my car out of nowhere. And I've been like, Oh, that's, it it just, it's like inspiration strikes. (laughs) Yeah. Sounds so pretentious, (laughs) but it's just, uh, I, I have never exactly like sat down at a blank page and been like, what am I going to write a story about? Turn on the inspiration. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It just, you kind of have to just let yourself be open to it. Yeah. And I think as you do that more, you kind of recognize what ideas are worth pursuing and what ideas are kind of, um, you know, maybe not quite as inspired as you would hope for them to be. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a solid answer. Okay. So speaking of like more like some of the stuff we cut, you covered in the class, um, obviously there's a big, the characters and the idea of like a protagonist versus an antagonist is like crucial to storytelling. I guess as someone who's like maybe new to, to filmmaking or screenwriting, like, is that, is there always going to be, I think people confuse maybe an antagonist as always like an evil villain or Mm -hmm. like a person that is like, um yeah like an evil villain so i guess maybe can you like unpack this idea that like an antagonist can be more than just like an evil villain and i guess is there is there always an antagonist like in a good story yeah i think it's it is really difficult to sort of um it's just easy to say oh you need a good guy and a bad guy. That's what it sounds like when you say a protagonist and an antagonist. Mm-hmm. And it's not what it is at all. And it's a lot more complex than that, I think. I think every good story has some form of an antagonist. Mm-hmm. And it's just going to be the form of whatever character is putting the most pressure on your protagonist to get where they want to be. Mm-hmm. So if you have a movie like um, you know, Harry Potter or Star Wars or, or any of these superhero movies, you have a very clear heroes and villains you Mm -hmm. know who the good and the bad characters are and that's that's not a bad thing to have in a story at all Mm -hmm. but i think in movies that are a lot more character driven like little miss sunshine which we we spoke of the antagonist in that movie i would say is her dad because he's the one who's putting that pressure on her to Mm -hmm. be a winner Mm -hmm. and 
building that tension and stress as the story unfolds and also dealing with his own failures as Mm -hmm. he goes. So that's not necessarily a typical antagonist, but that is a character who is standing in the way of your protagonist getting what they ultimately need. Mm. So is there an example? I'm trying to think of an example of where the antagonist isn't like a person, but more of like an idea or a, yeah, like a thought that's holding your protagonist back or is that not a thing? I mean, I wouldn't say it's not a thing. Mm -hmm. I think, um, it's hard to think of an example right now. I think there's going to be a lot of things that stand in the way of a protagonist. And I'm sure if I thought about it, I could find a movie where maybe there was, um, more of an element like time mm-hmm. or some pressing situation that mm-hmm. served more opposition than any physical character could. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that sort of operates in that way. I think one exercise for students to do though is like now when you're watching movies is just like think about this. Like think about, oh, like the protagonist probably is pretty easy and in some movies the the antagonist is too, but like Little Miss Sunshine, that's that's not necessarily like an easier one to pinpoint. So like and same with like the structures, like try to watch movies and see when are the structures, when are all these points you talked about. Um, another question I had kind of following up about protagonists, I, you kind of mentioned in the class, uh, the idea of having like multiple protagonists. And if that's the case, maybe it's like best to switch the pro- main protagonist to the secondary character. But I guess my question is like, are there movies where there are equal protagonists? Like, I guess I'm wondering, like the first thing that came to mind is like the Avenger movies, mm-hmm. like, are those obviously like some of the Avengers don't have equal roles. So is like Iron Man always like the protagonist mm. or does it depend on the film? Like I think with those ones and and I've admittedly not seen all of the Avenger movies. So if they're all the same. So <laughs> if you've seen one, <laughs> uh, we're going to get so much hate for that. <laughs> I, I'm like scared to talk poorly of the Avengers. So I will not. <laughs> but I think it like each of those films probably has one character that's a little more central in the story being told than the others. Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of the same for any ensemble. There are obviously plenty of movies where there are um, multiple people who are involved, who are equal characters and that's fine too. You can have multiple um, protagonists, essentially. Mm-hmm. My advice would be to make one just a little bit more central. Try to focus on one story a little more than the others because that's going to give you a little bit of an easier time finding that drive and that that linear narrative. Um, I think mm-hmm. it's a lot more difficult once you add more protagonists into it and then your story can go in all of these different directions um, away from what you're ultimately trying to do with the story so try to pick one even if you have an ensemble um but protagonists like antagonists are very um nuanced and complex and you know they don't always have to succeed in the end it just depends on the story you're telling or if you have a movie like nightcrawler you have or a show like breaking bad you have an anti-hero who you're watching pursue a goal that is really hard to root for because they're mm, mm, mm-hmm. anti-heroes, they're terrible people. But the way the stories are told... You're rooting for them. Yeah, you kind of get a, build that sympathy. That's a lot more challenging to do. Um, it's kind of like when I was watching, uh, what is it, Narcos on Netflix, mm-hmm. and I'm like rooting for Pablo Escobar. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. This is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's a really hard thing to do, but um, I think great writers who can write great anti-heroes are able to build that sympathy. Mm -hmm. And they do all the other things that a protagonist is supposed to do. They hit all the beats. They have those Mm -hmm. revelations. They are pursuing what they want, um, but they're bad people instead of good people. All right. A movie just popped into my mind that I want to see. We're filming this in the midst of baseball postseason. You remember the movie The The Rookie? Yeah, Dennis Quaid. Um, who's the antagonist in that? Oh man! Or is it like himself, or his like 
past or or is there another i can't remember if there's like another character his dad or something that like is holding him back and pushing him to like prove himself you know i would have to watch that again Mm, but it's hard because there are movies like that where you're like i mean i don't remember who kind of stands in his way yeah Um, i think like the challenge is like he was like he's like a washed up like baseball player who never made the majors and then he is teaching high school and then realizes he has this chance because he like still is pretty good at pitching and I'm just trying to think of like the per the thing or the idea to me that like is like against him is more like his his past or himself almost like holding himself back Mm -hmm. but maybe there's I don't know, maybe I would have to watch it again, too. I would, too. Okay. <laughs> but it's it's a good point. I think there are a lot of examples you can point to where there's not one character that's in the way. And yeah. I think sometimes you have multiple characters and elements that stand in the protagonist's way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that, that's okay. a good example. If you guys have any idea examples, uh, let us know. Yeah. All right. Question about three-act structure. This is like the main kind of storytelling structure you covered in the class um but i guess i'm wondering is like is there a non 3x structure or is that just not like an as interesting story i think there there is there are all kinds of different ways of telling stories Mm -hmm. um there's something called the sequence structure which i've never used which is exactly what it sounds like it's just a sequence of Mm -hmm. other events Mm -hmm. um i think if you watch movies like um Pulp Fiction, it's really difficult to identify the three acts because the time is so Mm -hmm. Mm nonlinear. There's a million movies where the time is is, um, altered in the story. Um, I think the thing with the three act structure that's good, other than its flaws, which I I pointed out in the video, which it it really doesn't give you a roadmap for the second act. Mm -hmm. Um, It really just is a good way to keep yourself in line and keep yourself focused on hitting the changes you need to hit when you need to hit them Mm -hmm. because especially if you're writing the first draft and and i'm not sure if you've started writing or not but sometimes i'll write a first draft and uh not worry about the page numbers and just try to write it and i come away with a 160 page story and Mm -hmm. realize i need to cut 60 pages out and then you read through it and you find those points that you're like oh this should be moved up or this should be moved back or it it just kind of helps you put the pieces in place Mm -hmm. I think especially as you're finding your footing. Yeah. Um, I think one thing that I learned watching you teach this class is like, at least the process you're teaching is, I, I don't know, for some reason I thought like as a screenwriter, you would just like start writing your screenplay and just write your screenplay. But like, you know, the outlining all the scenes and the, the acts and then the scenes, like, it's a lot of work before you actually start, um, you know, writing out who your characters are. I mean, it totally makes sense that that's the way that you should write a screenplay. But I don't know. I guess I just imagine like you and other screenwriters, like just sitting down, starting with like scene one and just like writing dialogue and uh, just going from there. (laughs) And I think some writers can do that. Some Mm -hmm. writers can operate in that way. And that's something I didn't really touch on in the course, but every process is different Mm -hmm. you could read three different books on screenwriting and you're going to get three different versions of how to write a screenplay yeah it's going to be unique to the person Mm -hmm. but i think for me um i don't see any better way than kind of knowing what you're doing and organizing yourself and your thoughts and all of your ideas before you actually start on the first draft yeah because i've tried to write screenplays that way too and and maybe that's just me but it's it generally tends to fall apart or you get lost. I guess I'm not like a fiction writer. So I'm wondering for like people who write like novels, do you think a lot of them do the same where they like outline the story and then go back and write the whole story? Or do they, do people just, I guess, like you said, people probably just do it every way. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I'm sure, you know, I've heard of a lot of novel writers who outline their stories, especially yeah. with something like that, where you're coming away with hundreds of pages. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to make those mistakes where you have to go back and keep, you know, the revision can just be a huge mess if you don't have it organized. 
One other question I have is, and I remember this from my screenwriting class in film school, was this idea of like staying away from too much direction. And you talked about like camera moves or wide shots or whatever. But when people are like describing in their in their screenplays, do you think it's okay for people to like give like intricate details about like say it's like a bedroom setting and there's certain like posters on the wall and things like that as a screenwriter do you think like the screenwriter is thinking about that and including it in the screenplay or is a lot of that just like after the screenplay is written the director kind of comes up with that by themselves or maybe in collaboration with the screenwriter they kind of work out those details I think it kind of depends on a lot of things. It it depends on the writer and it depends on the context of the scene. Mm -hmm. So if you're introducing a character who's, you know, has a ton of posters on the wall, if a kid walks into his bedroom and there's all these rock music posters on the wall, Mm -hmm. then I think that's an important fact to include because that tells you right away what kind of kid this is before he can even say a word. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it can really give a lot of context and subtext to what's going on. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if it's just a general location, if someone's walking through a park, you don't need to describe everything that's going on in the park because it's just there's a a tree on the left side of the pathway (laughs) or whatever. 145 degrees ahead of him. it's (laughs) It's, you know, it's, I think you just need to be Uh, selective with what you choose to include in your story because every word that you write in the script needs to be there for a reason it needs to be there to to either set the tone set the scene um, tell the reader some piece of information that they need to know Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would just recommend reading a lot of screenplays because that's a good way to see how different writers um, approach their scripts and yeah and then, like watching the movie and comparing even to the screenplay, like what it turns into, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think, too, I'd recommend, unless you want to direct, um, read a bunch of screenplays no matter what, but pay attention, especially to the descriptive action in the scripts that are not written by the director, mm-hmm. because those directors will put um, directorial notes in their screenplay sometimes mm-hmm. or leave a ton of information out of a descriptive action if they kind of know what the scene is yeah so it kind of alters the way the screenplay is written but um Mm -hmm. i don't think enough to make a difference but i think it's just something to keep in mind if you're like well wes anderson has all these uh directions in his descriptive action a lot of them yeah i would imagine i mean his films are so like specific in style and very intricate and specific yeah um so you know, I think just make sure what you're putting in there matters to the story you're telling. That's mm-hmm. the fundamental rule to keep in mind on that one. Yeah. All right. My last question. I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I think people might be interested. Um, do you know like what, and I'm sure there's like a giant range, but do you, do you know what like the going rate for like a screenplay in Hollywood is or anything close. Yeah. It's, to... it's a very broad range. Yeah. I think some writers can sell a small screenplay, um, you know, for anywhere from 10 to $50,000. Mm-hmm. Or if you're someone like Aaron Sorkin or one of these top level writers, you can sell a script for a million dollars or more. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's famous that like, Panic Room, the Jodie Foster movie written by um, David Kep, I believe, sold for $4 million. Wow. So 10000 to $4 million is yeah, kind that, of... <laughs> That's the range you can expect if you sell a uh, screenplay. Yeah. I would just say, too, I think, you know, if, if you're in, like, not to sound like your coach or something, uh, but if you're in it for the money only, it, you're just not going to get a lot out of it. You're not going to enjoy it. And I don't think you'll ever get as good at at it as you could be if you just wanted to do it because you enjoy telling stories and you want to find new ways to approach storytelling and film. Yeah. And, um, you know, the money is a nice aspect of being a professional screenwriter, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, that's never what it's all about. Yeah. I think that's a great way to end it. Um, well, we hope you've really enjoyed this video, this chat, We hope you've enjoyed the class. If you are in the class, make sure you let us know. Um, If there's anything we can do to make it better, 
we're always willing to to update it and um, try to make it the best it can be. And if you enjoyed the class, make sure you leave a review. Those really help us and the class and other students know if this is the right class for them. So please do that. And if you're not in the class, uh, check it out and we'll leave links uh, in the description of the video so you can enroll and learn the entire screenwriting process. So Ryan, it's been good chatting and uh, we'll see you guys in another video or maybe in another class. Bye, Bye. everyone.